In the beginning, God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit. It shall be food for you. Genesis 1.29 Man was designed to eat plant foods. At the Sermon on the Mount, God said, amongst other things, according to the Gospel, Matthew 25, 40, Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me, indicating that you shall be judged for those things. And today is Bart K. Judgment Day. Looks like you got some explaining to do. <laughs> okay, for Judgment Day. Here's a close-up, by the way. All right, so I could also call this video um, is the Paleo Keto Carnival, Carnivore Low Carb Diet a joke? And yes, it is. All right, we'll start out with Bart though because Bart was a guy who I had a conversation with about a week ago or so and he doesn't allow much of a conversation. So I'm going to put the conversation here today and we're going to talk about what is known about the relationship of paleo keto carnivore low carb diet versus vegetarian vegan diets for general health all cause mortality as well as for diabetes and cancer okay so first of all the most useful thing i ever learned after you know being a doctor for over 30 years is that if humans eat a primarily starch based diet a plant based diet with mostly starch to satisfy their hunger they end up being healthy, and that's more useful than anything I ever learned in pre-med, med school, residency, fellowship, and attending work. And the reason is because your gut is stretched. That's early satisfaction of hunger. Starch is basically a polymer of glucose wrapped in fiber from a plant food. And starch is basically pea for potato, SP, sweet potato, rice, uh, beans, peas, lentils, garbanzos, quinoa, oatmeal. And um, they stretch your stomach, providing early satisfaction of hunger, and then it goes into your intestinal tract, and the digestive enzymes have to separate the fiber from the glucose, and so the glucose is slowly absorbed into the blood. And here's a curve of blood glucose level versus time, and the glucose level slowly rises, and it stays normal for a prolonged amount of time. That is in comparison, if you eat just simple sugars with no fiber, the blood glucose kind of spikes, pancreas overcompensates, releasing a lot of insulin, and the sugar comes down relatively rapidly. That sometimes can cause symptoms. It can sometimes cause what is called rebound hypoglycemia. But the point of this is starch is the best food in the world. It is what you should get the vast majority of your calories from. It is the best way to satisfy your hunger. And if you only know that, you could probably do pretty well. It's the most important thing anybody can know about health. All right, so here you are. This is you. You know, hopefully by middle age, a person gets their act together for health. But uh, sooner, you know, the, late is better than never. All right, the typical American's a disaster. They eat meat, processed food, oils. They're fat and sick by the time they're in their 40s or 50s. They get put on a bunch of drugs, drug, drug, drug. Then they go for surgery, chop, chop, chop. Bye, bye, money. Dead prematurely. Okay. To win the game, the longest lived people in the history of the world have been these plant-based populations eating you know, 90, 95% or more typically of uh, plant foods. And usually then they don't need to take any pills. The Johnson keeps working for a long time. Okay. Nowadays it's a little more complicated. There's a lot of toxins in the water and the food, so you got to be a little more careful about avoiding them. Okay, we're going to go through some basic common sense stuff, and then we're going to go through a whole bunch of scientific paper. So basically, look at your teeth. Look at your teeth in the mirror. They're flat, like a herbivore, like a horse in this picture here. Okay, look at our intestinal tracts. we got like a 22-foot-long intestinal tract that is typical of herbivore animals. Okay, the carnivores, you know, they don't want the meat to putrefy. Like, you know, putrefying meat, how disgusting that is. got short intestinal tracts. And they got big, sharp teeth. Also, the other thing about their teeth is it, 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 it only goes uh, up and down, whereas we've got a jaw that goes, um, you know, can go side to side to grind plant food. And I got a flat teeth. Okay, another thing, too, just common sense. Imagine you are walking down a path in a forest. And you see a, a dead deer, a carcass, you know, there's flies buzzing around it. Do you want to, do you instinctively feel you must get down on your knees and take a bite out of it? 
Your teeth, our teeth can't even tear its flesh, okay? We're not made to eat that. It's disgusting. You go to the store, you know, to buy meat, ground meat. It's disgusting. What makes it taste good is you fry it, you put ketchup and mustard and all these other things on there, lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, and a bun and all that. We don't want to take a bite out of that. On the other hand, if you see fruits and vegetables, all these right here, they're lovely. I think the reason we have color vision is so we can see when a fruit is ripe on the table. We want that. We are attracted to that. About the only thing more attractive than that is a bowl of fruit, you know, carried by a woman, okay? But that's about as good as it gets. Okay, now a couple things about the vegan diet. It is well known. This is not some mystery. It is well known that it is much, much, much more healthier than a meat-based diet. It's not even close. Okay, there's, there, you know, I, I haven't ever seen a study where the meat diet is better than the plant-based diet. Okay, and I've seen many, gosh, thousands. All right, Beyond Meatless: The Health Effects of Vegan Diets, the Adventist Cohort. So the healthiest of the Seventh-day Adventists, they're from like Loma Linda in particular, Los Angeles suburb, and it's part of their religion, Seventh-day Adventists, to eat primarily a plant-based diet and some of them are 100% vegan many of them are you know subsets of vegetarianism they could be uh, lacto ovo you know eggs and uh, milk some are pesco vegetarians okay but the more close they are to vegan the healthier they are the longer they live <clears throat> and the less disease they have okay now here's another study and this was done by a uh, group out of Harvard, you know, the Harvard School of Public Health. Here, I'm going to see if I can hide my little thing here. And basically what they found, and this is, you know, Willett, Walter Willett, Frankie, all these guys, what is the effect of different specific dietary fats? Now, the worst one is the blue. This is trans fats. Trans fats are a disaster. That's an, a processed food. It's uh, quite bad. Some, similar to saturated fat. But the next is saturated fat. Quite worse. It causes an increase in mortality. What that means is the more sat fat you eat, the sooner you die, okay? And what's the point of that? Saturated fat is like saying animal fat. The vast majority of saturated fat comes from typically animal foods in the diet, like dairy, for example, and eating meat. So that's a, that's a valuable thing to know. More saturated fat you eat, the worse. The sooner you're likely to die. Then you got the MUFA, monounsaturated fat, which is classically, you know, olive oil. And then polyunsaturated fat. PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. In my opinion, all the fats are bad, but saturated fat is worse than the other ones. That is worth knowing. Because, you know, how can you eat meat? <laughs> all right, it, it's going to go on and on. Now, here's more studies here. Association of animal and plant protein intake with all-cause mortality. Basically, the higher the animal protein intake, it was positively associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. Plant protein, on the other hand, was inversely associated with, um, you know, all-cause mortality and uh, cardiovascular mortality. So remember that the more animal protein you eat, the worse off you are, more likely you are to die, okay, or have cardiac problems, okay? The plant protein is associated with being protective because of the plants, not the protein itself. Okay, low-carb diets increase in all-cause mortality. A low-carbohydrate diet based on animal sources was associated with higher all-cause mortality in men and women. Vegetable was associated with lower all-cause and cardiovascular disease mortality rates. Okay, and these are big studies. These populations here, they're talking about, you know, the sample set of females over 85,000, men over 45,000, okay, over 44,000. So these are big numbers. Here's another one in Swedish women. Low-carbohydrate diet, you know, which means a high protein diet, big study sample set, 43,000 patients. Low carb diets, high protein diets were associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay. Animal protein induces an anabolic effect that raises blood lipids, like including blood cholesterol, and it activates mTOR and it, it increases the risk of disease, of, you know, atherosclerotic disease, for example. Okay, here's another study. Low carbohydrate diets and all cause mortality. This one was like on the ballpark of like a 30% increase in all cause mortality. Low carbohydrate diets are associated with significantly higher risk of all cause mortality. This is what I mean. I'm saying it's, it's idiotic to think that these diets are good for your health. You know, the only studies I'm aware of for all cause mortality show that these diets increase all cause mortality. Low carbohydrate diet from plant or animal sources. 
A low carbohydrate diet from animal sources is worse, higher all cause, and cardiovascular mortality. I also think you know high fat plant diets are bad compared to low fat vegan diets, but I'm making the point here that. Um, and this, believe me, is not a biased audience. You know, this, some of these guys out at Harvard, the Harvard School of Public Health, they promote a Mediterranean diet, which is an idiotic diet as well. Okay, just so you know. But uh, the more animal, paleo, keto, carnivore, high fat you go, the worse it gets in general. Okay, there's more to it than that, but <clears throat> that's a general thing. Okay, low carbohydrate diets, low fat diets. Okay, so what does this one says? Higher mortality was observed for overall low carbohydrate diet, and especially for unhealthy low carbohydrate diet. All right, and then it's the benefit is coming from the low fat diet. Okay, here's another one. By the way, Nathan Pritikin has said the two main categories are diet are high fat diets and low fat diets. Okay, protein tends, doesn't tend to vary as much, but high protein diets are also bad. They end up with high blood lipids, a similar effect. Cardiovascular disease mortality and cancer in vegetarians. Vegetarians have significantly lower ischemic heart disease. That means coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis of the heart, less heart attacks, okay? And they also have significantly lower cancer. I mean, why wouldn't you want that? 30% reduction in heart disease in this study, as well as 18% reduction in cancer. And the point is, this isn't even making it low-fat, low-sodium, no oils. You do all that, and it's much lower. It's dramatically lower. Dramatic improvements in health by going low-fat, low-sodium, vegan with no oils, like the Esselstyn diet. Okay, uh, position of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Vegetarians and vegans are at reduced risk of certain health conditions, including ischemic heart disease. That means heart attacks, uh, atherosclerotic heart disease. Type 2 diabetes, the type that adults typically get. Hypertension and certain types of cancer and obesity. Basically, almost everybody dies from something related to this type of stuff here. Diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and atherosclerotic related ischemia, okay, or cancer. I mean, that's what people die from in Western countries, by far most common. And that's what also they get not stuck on meds. And, you know, I hope you realize I'm not trying to demonize Bart K. I'm not trying to demonize saturated fat or paleo keto or carnivore diets. Okay, so here is the gentleman, Bart K, that I had my pseudo conversation with. And a couple points I would make, like I've sort of alluded to here. Plant foods give you the good stuff. You know, most Americans are low in fiber. Plants are where fiber comes from. The cell wall of every plant cell contains fiber. Plant cells are high in potassium, which is a vasodilator, opens up artery. P for plants, P for potassium. Magnesium is located in the center of cholesterol, I'm sorry, in the center of chlorophyll, the plant molecule, so you eat your plants and that's what you get. Nitrates are the precursors, especially found, let's say, in greens, for example, you know, arugula and all the other salads still have some. And those um, are made into systemic nitric oxide to dilate your arteries. You also feel good from going in the sun. You get that systemic phase of dilation. You got precursors of nitric oxide, you know, right in your skin, subcutaneous areas. Okay, plants got a lot more antioxidants. Animals don't. The animals already used them up. Okay, glucose, meaning that it comes as a, it comes as a carbohydrate, especially in the form of starch is best. All right, low fat vegan, other things. So you get the fiber, which lowers your risk of colon cancer, lowers your risk of leaky gut, autoimmune diseases. It also uh, encourages the excretion by defecation of excess estrogen levels. So it lowers your estrogen levels. It lowers blood cholesterol. It lowers atherosclerosis risk. It decreases the risk of impotence. You know, no guy wants to be impotent. A low fat vegan diet helps prevent impotence. It lowers your blood pressure which also is protective against heart disease, atherosclerosis, and dementia. It lowers insulin resistance, thus it lowers your risk of type 2 diabetes. The amino acid composition in plants is different than in animal foods. There's less leucine, which tends to be the rate-limiting step for activation of mTOR, which is a nutrient-sensing pathway telling cells to replicate. You don't want increased rates of cell replication with cancer. So what I'm saying is this is one other way that the animal protein increases the risk of cancer. Okay, uh, Bart says, go by the science. Well, the science supports a plant-based diet. It's obvious. It's overwhelming. I'm going to show you a bunch of papers real quick here, but it's overwhelming. It's not like it's a close thing. It's not like it's, you know, five to four. It's more like a hundred to zero. Okay, okay. now here's some things that Bart K says. Just want you to know what this guy says. He says diabetes is due to elevated blood glucose, but that's actually not correct. Elevated blood glucose is a symptom of insulin resistance. Okay, and insulin resistance is primarily caused by excessive dietary fat, especially saturated fat. Okay, 
Bart K says the best diet is 100% animal foods with zero carbohydrate. I've even seen him say carbohydrates are a poison. Okay, that's the opposite of the truth. The best diet for human health, based on tons and tons of study and epidemiological evidence as well, is a low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet. And in the modern world, preferably 100% vegan because we have to detoxify from our previous experience with the SAD diet. All the, all the naturally occurring populations do eat some animal products. They're all like, the healthiest ones tend to be in the ballpark of 95% plant-based, but they do eat some animal products. Okay, another thing Bart K says, he says people don't need to eat fiber at all. But if they don't eat fiber, then they're at markedly increased risk of abdominal pressure syndrome, as described by Dennis Burkett. And we're going to go over that briefly. Epidemiology, he says, is not helpful for understanding nutrition. But that is wrong. He doesn't like epidemiology because all of the epidemiology shows low fat, low sodium, plant based diets are closer to 100% vegan, you know, getting up in the 90s in the percent of calories from plants. They're the healthiest people in the world. That's what makes people healthy. So, of course, he doesn't like that. The Esselstyn diet, you know, is the most successful diet by far ever for prevention of coronary disease. It's 100% vegan, low fat with uh, no, um, no oils. Okay, there was a Plant Chompers is a guy, pretty famous, uh, you know, nutrition uh, YouTube video channel, and he made a video of uh, Bart K debunking Bart K. And Bart K in that video, he showed Bart K saying that there was no scientific literature to confirm his dietary recommendations were the best ones. Okay, so <laughs> that's a pretty big statement. He has no scientific literature. He says it just hasn't been done yet. Well, you know, excuse me, you're sort of saying that's what you believe. You know, I can, I can. Real quick, get 100 papers showing you how great the vegetarian diet is, especially the vegan diet. It's obvious. Okay, here's just one point about plants. If you are out in the sun on a hot day, it's 100 degrees outside, it's very easy for you as a human. Just walk underneath the tree and get some shade. A plant doesn't have that option. It has to stay there in the hot sun. So the plant protects itself by making antioxidant chemicals. And when we eat the plant, we get those chemicals to protect itself from the, the heat of the sun. Okay. And you want that because you need the antioxidants to present what is called oxidative stress. Basically, you can think of it like a seesaw. If there's more oxidants, you know, chemicals that want to steal electrons, they um, will have a harmful effect if you don't have any oxidants to counteract them, like to protect your, your lipids, for example. Okay. But there's a lot more to it than that. That's like things like vitamin C and all that stuff, glutathione and all that. Okay, one last point on eating the plants, you get the nitrates. So you especially get those, for example, from eating greens. When you eat the greens, you know, here's a leaf of the, the greens. They go onto your mouth, and they contain nitrate, NO3. They go on your tongue. There's bacteria in the back of your tongue. That converts it to nitrite. This should be an I here, NO2. And then when that goes into your stomach, the stomach acid facilitates more of the conversion to nitric oxide, NO. That's absorbed in your blood. has a systemic vasodilatory effect. Okay, and you don't want to eat things that tend to kill the bacteria in the back of your tongue, like F-minus toothpaste and mouthwash and stuff, because then you'll be less effective at making that conversion. The older you get, the more you need that, because you don't produce as much from your arterial lining cells, your endothelial cells. Okay, here's abdominal pressure syndrome, as described by Dennis Burkett. He was the Irish uh, Christian missionary doctor who ended up going to um, Africa, and he actually ended up becoming in charge of the epidemiology in Africa. And what he noticed was the persons who had come from, for example, England, that were eating, you know, old-fashioned uh, low-fiber diets, you know, bread and jam and tea and meat. They had a lack of fiber and they were constipated. This led to rectal hemorrhoids from the back pressure, straining and defecation. That's called the Valsalva maneuver. The back pressure caused outpouchings of their sigmoid colon. That's called diverticulosis. One pops, it's diverticulitis. Every day in every Western hospital in the world, there's you know probably a at least one patient admitted for diverticulitis. It's so common. I've seen thousands of those cases. Okay. Also, because what fiber does is it adds water to the stool. So without fiber, your your stool is dried out. So when you defecate, you're popping out a Tootsie Roll rather than a plant eater. When they, when they defecate, they pop out typically something very much like a cow patty. Um, and that back pressure straining at the stool for defecation also causes the top of the stomach to pouch into the chest. That's called a hiatal hernia. And that predisposes to gastric acid coming up into the chest causing gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD. Okay, that's the feeling of heartburn, discomfort. And that'll change the lining of the hiatal hernia to become like what is called Barrett's esophagus, metaplasia of the lining, and that predisposes to increased risk of esophageal cancer. It's like an adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Rather than the old days, you used to get smoker drinker uh, squamous cell carcinoma of that area. HH is hiatal hernia. Okay, of course, there are increased risk for gallstones. 
But what also happens because the stool is dried out on the right side of the colon, um, they're predisposed to forming little balls of stool called a fecal lith. Lith means stone, fecal lith, feces stone, or sometimes they're called a pentacle lith inside the appendix. They block the connection between the cecum, the colon, and the appendix. But the appendix has mucus glands that continue to secrete, but now the mucus can't get into the rest of the colon. It's blocked by the fecal lith, and so it'll sometimes cause the appendix to pop. Much higher incidence of appendicitis in meat eaters. Okay, The back pressure straining causing pressure down into the leg also causes um, varicose veins. All right, in men, the constipation and defecation straining can lead to a varicocele, which heats up the testes and can cause infertility. So yes, you can become um, infertile due to constipation. Okay, then the other thing too, you know, I mentioned when I had my conversation with Bart, you know, the importance of this book here, the China study, and Bart mocked the book. He always mocks the great pioneers of nutrition because, again, all the real nutrition research promotes plant-based diets, okay? And what T. Colin Campbell discovered in his research, this book was co-authored with his son, but what he discovered in his research was the more animal protein that um, the animals ate in his studies, all like the rodent studies, for example, the higher their rates of cancer and cancer growth. And also he saw in humans, the more the populations were eating animal protein, the higher their cancer rate. He actually felt that the casein, the protein in milk, was the most powerful uh, cancer promoter. And by the way, you know, you look at the rates of cancer death um, in USA, they really haven't changed that much since the 1970s. There has not been much progress in the treatment of cancer. That's an important point because some people think, oh, the modern world's got all this modern technology and it's really making a difference. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, and so here's showing cancer foci. Um, and basically, the more animal protein the person met, ate, the more cancer they had and the more likely it was to progress. All right, and then here was one of the things that T. Colin Campbell talked about is that you could kind of use animal protein. You could also say surrogate fat. Uh, saturated fat was a bit of a marker for animal protein. Um, the insulin-like growth factor was kind of similar. And because the sat fat causes insulin resistance and is associated with eating animal food, higher insulin levels are also associated with it. So what's the most important one? T. Colin Campbell felt the most important indicator was animal protein. And so the fact that the amount of cancer going up and being worse correlates with sat fat, insulin-like growth factor level, high insulin levels, was in some sense in part a surrogate measure being related to animal protein was the feeling of T. Colin Campbell. Okay, and another uh, <clears throat> person, it's not just T. Colin Campbell, it's not just all the epidemiology data. Uh, Dean Ornish did a, a big landmark study where he took patients with low-grade prostate cancer, and this was a randomized control, and that's one of the things, too, Bart had said. Show me some randomized control trials. Well, they don't do that many randomized control trials with nutrition, but here is an example of one where they took a bunch of biopsy-proven prostate cancer patients that had declined uh, treatment and went, wanted watchful waiting, so to speak, and one group of them he put on a you know primarily vegetarian diet, and they kept their PSA stable or lowered them and did not go on to any additional tr uh, treatment versus the patients who went on with, you know, standard, the control group, if you will, uh, many of them went on to needing some type of more invasive therapy, be that either surgery or radiation. So the point was it suggested a protective effect from a uh, vegetarian diet. Okay, here's another article talking about saturated fat, meaning animal fat. Uh, being more metabolically harmful to the human liver than unsaturated fat or simple sugars, which is kind of interesting because simple sugars implies, you know, uh, some fructose in there. But, of course, that's a whole other topic. We're not going to get into that day, the differences between fruit and high fructose corn syrup. That's a topic for another day. But the point of it was that the saturated fat induced the greatest amount of intrahepatic triglycerides, the greatest amount of fatty liver. So it had a major negative effect. So these are all bad things because being pushed towards hypertension, towards fatty liver, which is really like diabetes of the liver, that all pushes towards diabetes and secondary complications, of course. You know, coronary artery disease, heart disease, heart attack, and dementia, okay? Okay, now here's one thing, too. Uh, these ketogenic diets, you know, people a lot of times uh, have elevated blood ketones. Um, and from eating the high-fat diets, and that is associated with fatigue, the lack of fibers associated with constipation, 
Sounds like a great diet to me. Make yourself constipated and tired, okay? And then they'll say, well, it's, it decreases the risk of seizure, you know, in some refractory seizure patients. Yeah, great. You're slowing down your brain as well, which is good if you're, you're, you're hyperexcited and having seizure disorder. But, you know, I like my brain to be sharp and fast. I don't want a slow brain, you know, for that reason, okay? There's a difference between intrinsically fast and slow for disease. The other thing, too, is it's relevant to talk about a little bit about the history of nutrition, and I'm just going to briefly mention Cicero. Okay, so Cicero is the greatest of all Romans, and one of Cicero's quotes was, to not know what happened before you were born is to forever remain a child. So we should know a little bit about the history of nutrition and epidemiology. Okay, and it's pretty easy to, to go over some of the key points. So here is a Mexican-American border between Arizona and Mexico, and these two populations, the Tarahumara people, and the Pima uh, people, they used to be kind of combined populations. And the Tarahumara still live in northern Mexico in the Sierra Madre Mountains, Copper Canyon area. And they eat their old-fashioned diet, lots of corn and beans and local greens. They're world famous. Their name almost means fleet runner. And they're famous for running ultra marathons. Um, they'll run 100 mile uh, in, in just two days. And it's like every guy in town is not like just a fast guy. Nathan Pritikin was so impressed by them that he patterned his own dietary style after them. And they've gone out there and tested them. A guy named Bill O'Connor went out there and checked, you know, their total cholesterol average was around 136. They don't have a problem with hypertension, obesity, coronary artery disease. So anyways, um, then the Pima, by comparison, they've kind of adopted Americanized ways and westernized diets, something akin to the uh, standard American diet. They have tremendous problems with obesity, diabetes, hypertension, gallstones, and whatnot. And so this is a classic epidemiological story. The more westernized the population, the fatter and sicker they get. Okay, here, by the way, was the Pima Indians, like back in the 1800s. You know, they're really fit and strong looking. They look like a college wrestling team, okay? And that's what humans, you know, are sort of designed to look like, okay? To be fit and skinny. All right, here's another, okay, well, here's just a picture showing you yeah, a typical Tata Humada, you know, guys who can run 100 miles in two days. Here's a typical, you know, American or Pima cabbage's coronary artery bypass graft because atherosclerosis in the arteries of their heart, coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease, same thing. Getting their sigmoid colon resected for diverticulitis, appendicitis, surgical scar, um, gallbladder, surgical scar. And then they get a BKA, below knee amputation for diabetes. Okay, um... The Tatahumara, like I said, when they go out there and study them, they're incredibly healthy. Their average cholesterol was 136, and it's good to have a lower cholesterol. Guess what raises cholesterol? Eating meat and saturated fat. <laughs> okay, here's another population, the Yanomamo in, you know, South America, the Amazon jungle at sort of the border of Venezuela and Brazil. And, you know, they'll keep the same blood pressure from their teens into their elderly years, which is characteristic of somebody eating a plant-based diet who doesn't add salt to their food versus most Americans, the vast majority of them end up hypertensive. Okay, the ones that live into their later years especially. Okay, um, Norway had a lot of dairy in its uh, center, not so much in its periphery. In the center, they had a lot more autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis, for example. Finland, where they used to have a lot of dairy and a lot of meat, tons and tons of coronary artery disease, but around the 1970s to 1980s, they hired this guy, Pekka Puska, a physician out there, especially in this province called Karelia. And as they minimized their intake of saturated fat in animal foods, uh, they had a dramatic improvement, like an 84% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. That's an incredible reduction. And it's easy. Just avoid, you know, the saturated fat, the animal foods, reduce your dietary sodium intake. Okay. So what I'm saying is all the epidemiology supports this. Okay, if you eat tons of sodium like the Japanese did in the 1960s and smoke cigarettes, you get hypertension and you'll have a tendency to get intracranial atherosclerosis. This has been called Asian atherosclerosis. If you eat the high fat diets of the Westerners, this has been called Western atherosclerosis. You get especially coronary artery disease, but you also get uh, carotid artery in the neck, atherosclerotic disease. Oh, yeah, one more population with regard to the Japanese. The Japanese, when they ate primarily the rice-based diets, they were pretty healthy despite smoking a lot and a lot of sodium. The Okinawans were even healthier, and that's all because the Okinawans didn't eat all that sodium, okay? They ate a lot of sweet potatoes, they, and then they ate these populations, you know, the rice also is only 1% of calories from fat. Sweet potatoes only 1% of calories from fat, okay? 
You know, at this time, their average age was a uh, female of dying was 86, male uh, around 78 years of age, which is really, really good. The only longer lived population in the world was the Seventh day Adventists, and they're vegans, they're a subset of the vegans. They had the women live in about 88.6 years on average, and men about 85.3 years, and that's much, much better than other persons were doing. In California in 1985, the average female is about 79.6 at a time of death, and uh, uh, average man about 73.8. Okay, so I, I, I call this Bart K. Judgment Day. Okay, so what are some of the other points in here? Um, some of this is a repeat. I was mostly interested in this slide for epidemiology. Oh, the blue zones of Dan Butner. His original lecture, he said they were 95% or more plant-based. On his more recent lectures, now he starts saying 90%. There's always pressure to back off on 100% vegan, even though it's the best. Um, Let's see, we talked about Papua New Guinea. They ate, you know, 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes, 1% fat. They're skinny and fit. Plus, they had six times less cancer than Americans did because Americans that smoke similar amounts with all the fat they're eating, it's synergistically increasing their risk of cancer. Samanis, who were in South America and other population, indigenous, endemic, eaten um, primarily plant-based diet, they had, like, the best results of any population ever studied for cardiac calcium CT. Hardly any calcium in the coronary from atherosclerosis. All the epidemiology studies you go to, they're all going to show you the same thing. You're better off the more plants you eat. European graveyard studies, where they had to dig up a bunch of graveyards for construction work, the ones where the rich aristocrats were buried, where they, where they ate a lot of meat, they had a lot of uh, spinal dish. Dish means diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. It's also significant because it's associated with hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, and what. Whereas the peasants, you know, they're eating turnips and plant foods. They have hardly any dish of their spine. So you can also think of it as being spinal degeneration. Okay, European World War II rationing studies. So the, when the population was rationed meat and oils, um, dietary oils, they had a reduction in their obesity, their diabetes, and their coronary artery disease, despite the psychological stress. The point being is the diet was more important than the psychological stress. We talked about Finland, their demedification. Um, in China, also related to the book, The China Study by T. Colin Campbell, uh, the populations were typically eating like as much as around 90% of their calories from white rice before 1980, especially in the 1970s, let's say, and they had hardly any diabetes or, you know, autoimmune disease, less than 1% of the persons having diabetes, remarkably low. Whereas now China has a lot more of this one-child policy, the kid's spoiled, uh, gets fed more animal foods, more processed food, and their incidence of diabetes and obesity and diabetes is going up a lot as they become more westernized in their diets. People sometimes bring up the Maasai, and the Maasai, yeah, they do tend to be uh, skinny, a lot of them, but they've done autopsy studies on them, and they have lots of atherosclerosis. They eat a lot of meat in their diets. So the Eskimos also are much less healthy than is, uh, was previously thought. Dr. McDougall wrote a whole long essay about all their health problems. It's also been mentioned that they tend to have a genetic uh, mutation that makes them less, less inclined to go into ketosis, which thought might be a little bit protective with their high meat, high fat diet. Okay, here's a general overview summary of the major different dietary patterns. And basically, the average American westernized diet is pretty poor in almost every single way. A lot of diabetes, high blood pressure, myocardial infarction, heart attack, stroke, uh, impotence, cancer, bad. All right. Then you look at the East Asians, which means like the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Chinese. And their problem was eating way too much sodium. Because they ate a very low percentage of calories from fat, that had a protective effect. Um, and look, they got a relatively low incidence of diabetes. Um, they also ate a lot of fruits and vegetables, which was also protective. Their cigarette smoking was bad. So they would still get a lot of hypertension from the sodium. The cigarette smoking contributes to that. But they compensated for reasonably well by having low fat and getting the fruits and vegetables. So they still had pretty good lifespans, like the Japanese, for example. Um, the Indian diet... You know, I always thought everybody from India was healthy because I, I have a lot of Indian friends, okay, and they're skinny and energetic and everything. But it turns out persons from India have a relatively high incidence of diabetes and coronary artery disease. And after talking to a lot of them, yeah, there's some sat fat from the ghee butter. I think, though, my impression was they eat, a lot of them eat way too much fried food and they cook with oil, many of them. And I think that's leading to their high incidence of diabetes and coronary artery disease. Um, and then well, how do you win the game of health? Your best chance is low-fat, low-sodium vegan. You know, they're low on all this stuff. And they got the fiber. They're just, it's just the healthier. Just humans are designed for that. 
Okay, the more, you know, people say, oh, our eggs are good for the look. You know, the more eggs you feed a person, the more atherosclerosis you get. In an experimental study, if you want to induce atherosclerosis, you feed them eggs, okay? It's a, it's a perfect way to do it. If you want to make animals fat, feed them a lot of food with a lot of MSG in it. You'll get them to eat more. That'll make them fat. And then persons who are fat are predisposed to increase risk of diabetes, increase risk of uh, high blood pressure, increase atherosclerosis. Okay, oh, now what about uh, these diets with regard to atherosclerosis? So first of all, we've got, you know, the Ornish work again. He did uh, great work in here. This is a randomized controlled trial. The patients put on a low-fat vegetarian diet. They also stopped smoking, did some stress management, and a little bit of moderate exercise. But the big thing is a the diet. They had a marked reduction in their coronary artery atherosclerotic disease, okay, without the use of lipid-lowering drugs. And initially it was a one-year study, but then he did a follow-up study with five years follow-up on many of the patients, and they had a further reduction of their coronary artery disease. So that's, you know, big stuff. There's, there's other examples of people showing that you could dramatically reduce coronary artery disease, like the Kempner data, the Pritikin's experience, McDougall's experience, and other persons like the work of Armstrong, et cetera. But still, <clears throat> the more you lower fat and you lower saturated fat, <clears throat> the lower cholesterol goes, the less atherosclerosis the humans or the primates get. In animal research study, they found the same thing. T. Colin Campbell, you know, did even more research on re prevention and reversal of coronary artery disease. So here's his book, Prevent and Reverse Coronary Artery Disease. He cites all the papers in there. And he did his big study, was a real famous one, in the Journal of Family Practice, 2014. And what he showed was his patients had a 99.4 reduction in uh, risk of like a recurrent event, a uh, cardiovascular event. Um, Major events were, you know, things like a stroke or a heart attack, for example. The recurrent rate was 0.6%. That's incredibly low, 0.6%. And he even says that one patient who had the event didn't follow the diet. By the way, there's nothing like this in coronary artery disease management that's anywhere remotely close to this. But it doesn't get taught or doesn't catch on in conventional medicine because there's no money in it. You train somebody in the, you know, vegan diet, you don't get paid, or maybe you bring them to a course, you get a thousand bucks or something. You do a stent, thirty thousand dollars. You do a uh, open heart surgery, you can make hundred twenty, hundred fifty thousand all told altogether. So any hospital that wants to stay in business and make money, it's going to want open heart surgery for the money in comparison with going low fat vegan, which empowers the patient. So here's uh, Esselstyn's words again: ninety nine point four percent of adherent patients avoided major you know, cardiac events. Here's an example of a abnormal cardiac cath, coronary artery angiogram, where the vessel's quite narrowed. Stenotic is the medical word for that. And after following uh, 32 months on a plant-based diet, it resolved. It got better. It doesn't always get better. The component of the atherosclerotic plaque due to fat, necrotic core, lipid core, that can all resorb, you know, virtually completely. But, you know, the calcified part, the acellular fibrotic part, not as well. But still, this is remarkable. There's no, there's no paper showing paleo, keto, carnivore, low carb, any of those meat, high fat diets does this. I've never heard of that. I've never seen it. I don't think it exists as far as I know. And it wouldn't make sense for it to exist. You would expect those to worsen it. Every time I've read about it, they do. Okay, regression of atherosclerosis in primates and man. This is the Mark Armstrong paper. And so basically, he found basically how do you reverse atherosclerosis in an animal? You remove the stimulus, you remove the lipids, okay? Um, so the key was lowering the amount of lipids, okay? Low fat um, decreases the risk of atherosclerosis. Here's another paper, regression of atherosclerosis. This guy, uh, David Blankenhorn, did a lot of work on this, and he found it was what all types of fat increase the risk of atherosclerosis. So what you want to do is reduce all types of fat. And um, Nathan Pritikin also had said, fat is bad. Intrinsically, fat is, you know, atherogenic and obesogenic. It's like the most high concentration of calories there is. It's the opposite of low caloric density, like starches. Okay. Um, atherosclerosis, therefore, is appears best influenced by lipid lowering. Yeah, you decrease dietary fat, that's your best chance to reverse atherosclerosis to the extent that it can be reversed. Okay, um, here's this guy, William Roberts. He's the most famous cardiac pathologist in the world. He does tons and tons of uh, autopsies on patients who die of heart attacks and arrhythmias. Okay, and what he says is the most important thing for causing atherosclerosis is elevated blood cholesterol, your LDL cholesterol. And this other guy right here, Gregory Sloop, he's sort of the best researcher in the world for atherosclerosis. He says it's because the LDL cholesterol 
makes what one would call a uh, it sticks the it sticks the red blood cells together. Red blood cells have negative charge on their outer surface, and that way they repel each other. But if you get something in between them, like let's say this is the um, the LDL cholesterol, it causes the two red blood cells to stick together. So that's overcoming the zeta potential. The zeta potential is a negative charge on the outer surface of the red blood cells. So the LDL cholesterol is a bridging molecule, meaning it overcomes the zeta potential, can stick red blood cells together. Fibrinogen can do it. That's the clotting protein. Uric acid can also do it. Okay, when you're stressed out, you get increased release of acute phase reactant proteins from the liver, including fibrinogen. So that can that is prothrombotic. And you remember stress effects on the body as being chased by a tiger in the dark. So if the tiger were to scratch you, you would want your blood to clot relatively fast, so to speak, so you don't bleed to death, for example, is, is, is thought how that works. Anyways, this is the best book ever written on atherosclerosis. I've read a bunch of them. Um, and it explains the atherothrombosis theory if you want to understand it. But basically, fat causes your red blood cells to stick together. And that uh, increases the risk of blood clotting. Sodium vasoconstricts, narrows the arteries. But I, I make the point is that plant foods are the protective thing. Okay? All right, now here is... Um, a paper called Vegetarian Diet and Cholesterol and Triglyceride Levels, comparing, comparing the blood lipid levels of omnivores, so those are persons who eat some meat, with lacto-ovo vegetarians, lacto-milk, ovo-egg vegetarians, lacto-milk-only vegetarians. So the average total cholesterol in this study for the omnivores was 208. Okay, some, There's one other previous study on average cholesterol for Americans was 220, for example. Anyways, the average total cholesterol for a vegan was 141. And the significance of that is persons who keep their total cholesterol below 150 have a dramatically reduced risk of myocardial infarction. And Esselstyn, for example, followed up his patients with the goal of keeping their total cholesterol below 140. And that's total cholesterol. It's easy to go by total cholesterol, and that works, okay? Some people talk about LDL levels. So the LDL level in the omnivores was relatively high, 123. In the vegans, it was less than 70, which is what you want, 69 in this case. Okay, triglycerides were a little high at 155 in the omnivore. And in the vegans, they were 81, which is great, you know, below 100. Okay, so plant-based diets produce better blood lipids, low-fat plant-based diets. You don't want to be eating a high-fat plant-based diet. You know, oils could be called by some people a uh, high-fat plant food. They're toxic to arteries, all right? So normally your plasma should be translucent. You could you could read print through it versus when you eat a high fat meal, this becomes relatively opaque. You can no longer, you know, read print through it. And as I referred to earlier, there are typical red blood cells about seven microns in diameter, capillaries about five microns. So the red blood cell has to deform itself a little bit to pass through the capillary. When you have a, one of these bridging molecules around, like let's say LDL cholesterol from eating a high fat diet, high saturated fat diet, it sticks the red blood cells together so it's harder to get them through the capillary. Main reason to have, high, to have your blood pressure go up is to get blood to your brain. You know, when you're standing, it's the highest thing, you know, from gravity. So if you're pumping thicker blood, you know, like a milkshake instead of like water because it, there's a bridging molecule sticking the RBCs together, pressure has to go up. If you vasoconstrict the arteries and narrow them because of sodium, for example, pressure has to go up to pump through a constricted system. If you're deficient in potassium and magnesium vasodilators, you're going to be constricted, pressure has to go up. A typical American is all of those things. They eat high sodium, they eat high fat, and their diet's low in potassium, low in magnesium. So they screw, and low in nitrates, which is the vasodilator precursor for nitric oxide. So they screw themselves in five different ways to give themselves high blood pressure, and the high blood pressure, the pressure, hits against the arterial wall, and it damages the arterial wall. The, the arterial wall will compensate by laying down more collagen, fibrosis, and that's atherogenic in and of itself. So all of this is going in the wrong direction with a westernized diet, okay? And that means, you know, a high meat, high fat diet. So here's an example of the zeta potential. Zeta potential is a negative charge on the outer surface of the red blood cell, and that's because you've got cholesterol sulfates, you've got <clears throat> sialic acids, um, you've also got uh, other types of sulfates on there uh, causing a negative charge on the outer surface, the zeta potential. An acute infection can also cause the red blood cells to stick together because the IgM antibodies have a positive charge on the surface and they're big enough to grab two RBCs and stick them together. So that's another example of a bridging molecule. Okay, so the higher the LDL cholesterol, the thicker the blood becomes. That's th blood thickness is called viscosity. Um, 
These are bridging molecules. Like we said, IgM antibody with an acute infection, LDL cholesterol, fibrinogen, the clotting protein raised when the acute phase reactant proteins of the liver are released into the blood, which happens from stress, for example, sleep deprivation, or drinking caffeine. It's another reason why I don't think caffeine is a good idea. Uh, uric acid, which is elevated from eating meats, also from eating uh, fructose and a few other things in excessive amounts like high fructose corn syrup. So anyways, normally the zeta potential RBC should repel each other. Okay, here's an atherosclerotic plaque, and people often ask, is it reversible? And the answer is it's partially reversible. Again, you can reabsorb the lipid core, the fat component of it. You could reabsorb the necrotic core, the sort of dead cells, the acute clot component, which we rarely see, but you could reabsorb that. The more fibrotic, the more acellular the fibrosis part, the collagen, the less likely you could reabsorb that. So that's partially reabsorbable. Calcification part, you're not going to reabsorb that. That'll stay the same for decades. Um, so what you really want to do, though, is prevent them as much as you can. But once you go low-fat vegan you, and you drop your sodium down and you drop your dietary fat down, the endothelial lining cells, they tend to produce nitric oxide and you'll get vasodilation. So you can get a significant improvement in just a couple of days, okay? Um, and then give it more time you'll get even more improvement uh, if you follow the Esselstyn diet, for example. The most important thing to know about endothelial cells, arterial lining cells, is they make nitric oxide. It goes into the blood, it's a gas, and it prevents the platelets from clotting. It goes backward into the arterial wall, goes into the smooth muscle cells, and gets them to vasodilate. So you actually you need to know that. Nitric oxide is a protective thing in the arterial lining cells called endothelial cells, and high fat, high sodium meals impair its functions. That's why you don't want those. Okay, high fat meals also are damaging to blood flow for other reasons. They'll activate the neutrophils, the excess dietary fat, and then the neutrophils will release something called MPO, myeloperoxidase, and that interferes with the um, glycocalyx, the sugar coating of the endothelial cells, and it causes them to express prothrombotic molecules. So the bottom line is it damages blood flow, eating the high dietary fat. Okay, I've made entire lectures on this, so I go into all the details, but we're not going to go into all that right now. Okay, when high blood pressure comes, it hits the bifurcations at, at um, the median divider at bifurcations. This, for example, is in your neck, the carotid artery. So common carotid artery comes up in your neck about here, and then it bifurcates. External carotid goes to the face, internal carotid goes to the brain. But the higher the pressure hitting this median divider of tissue between the, the two branching arteries, the more it's going to bounce off of there and cause turbulent flow, which just means chaotic flow and retrograde flow, sometimes called eddy currents. And the more turbulent flow and retrograde flow you have, the more the endothelial cells get confused by that. They've got little hair cell-like um, part of their glycocalyx that senses the speed and direction of flow. So when it's abnormal, they sense possible injury and they prepare to clot. They'll shed their antithrombotic glycocalyx sugar co coating, structural sugar is what I meant in that context, and they'll express prothrombotic molecules and you'll start to form a clot. And that's where you form it, right opposite the median divider. I look at these things every day, CT angiograms. This is what you see. And by the way, atherosclerosis is a blood clot. You need to know that if you care about atherosclerosis. Once you think of it as a blood clot instead of just this cholesterol stuff, cholesterol theory of atherosclerosis causation is a subset. Atherothrombosis is the all-encompassing theory of atherosclerosis as pioneered by Gregory Sloop. You know, I showed in that book before. And I was so interested in Gregory Sloop's ideas about atherosclerosis that I called him on the phone and talked to him. And yeah, he's brilliant. And he, uh, everything he read, it totally correlated with all my experience. I've been, I've been doing angiograms and looking at CT angiograms, MRA angiograms for many years. You know, I did a fellowship with the emphasis on vascular disease when I was at Harvard, imaging guided surgery, also called interventional radiology, okay? So I've been trying to understand this for many, many years. And I can tell you that's what puts it all together. Okay, now getting back to diabetes. Supposedly my conversation with Bart was supposed to be primarily about diabetes. And what I'm trying to say is it's been known since back in the 1920s and even suspected before that going back to the 1800s that the cause of diabetes you know hyperglycemia increased blood glucose was due to fat dietary fat okay and so when you eat a high fat diet blood glucose goes up and you decrease what is called carbohydrate tolerance meaning that you've you've diminished your insulin sensitivity and this guy Hemsworth so J Shirley Sweeney showed this to medical students in the 1920s his paper was written in 1927 that you can take a bunch of healthy medical students, feed them a high-fat diet. Within two, two days, they'll convert to being insulin-resistant, and they'll test positive for diabetes on the oral glucose tolerance test. Whereas if you feed them you know, the uh, 
uh, sugar diet, the carbohydrate diet, and they won't test positive for insulin. Their insulin sensitivity stays good. Hemsworth just showed the same thing. If you feed, um, if you feed a high-fat diet, you subsequently develop insulin resistance and get hyperglycemia when you add glucose to that. Versus if you feed a high carbohydrate diet by itself, it doesn't cause that elevated blood sugar. So it's been known that fat is the main cause of insulin resistance, the main cause of type 2 diabetes back since 100 years ago, about 100 years ago, 1927. It's, nine, it's uh, you know, 2024 now, all right? So that's important to know. The reason that's important to know is most doctors don't know that, you know, okay? And they still have a tendency to recommend stupid things like, uh, you know, high-fat diets to diabetic patients. So hyperglycemia, the first detectable finding of um, diabetes is accumulation of fat within skeletal muscle cells, and especially saturated fat will accumulate in skeletal muscles. That's called intramyocellular fat. Um, that's been proven by nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. I'm going to talk about the guy who, did, who led that work, Gerald Shulman, in just a moment. So once you accumulate fat in the skeletal muscle, then it becomes insulin resistance, and the glucose you eat in a meal will then not be able to get in the muscle, so you get high blood glucose level after eating. Eating is called prandial, so it's the postprandial hyperglycemia, all right? And a lot of that glucose and will end up in the liver. There's also quite often the context of increased dietary fat, and they get a fatty liver. Having a fatty liver is like diabetes of the liver. It predisposes to, excuse me, worsening diabetes. Fat starts accumulating in the pancreas and damaging the pancreatic beta cells that make insulin. And the patient, if they continue down this path, they end up insulin deficient with insulin-dependent uh, type 2 diabetes. Okay, so what's the point? The point is minimize your dietary fat, especially saturated fat, which means don't eat animal foods, okay? So this is the point I'm saying. Barquet is recommending to eat 100% animal foods. And what I'm telling you here with all these slides and pictures is that animal foods are the biggest risk factor for cancer. They're the biggest risk factor for diabetes, okay? Obesity is also dramatically increased by oils, you know, omega-6 cooking oils, for example. And high fructose corn syrup also is a major player in making people sicker. And there's toxic estrogenic chemicals in the water and the food in the air that are making people fat and sick as well. But what I'm, what I'm saying is if you wanted to do something very quickly to improve your health, it would be to avoid animal foods. You know, animal foods are good if you're starving and there's nothing else available. But other than that, it's uh, best to avoid them. If you're taking any medicines for diabetes or high blood pressure or blood thinners, let your doctor know to help you titrate the dosages before you change your diet. Okay, this guy right here is Gerald Shulman. He's an MD, PhD, Harvard trained endocrinologist. And he's the guy who sort of led the group working with the nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And they confirmed that accumulation of fat within the skeletal muscle, he calls it intramyocellular lipid, was the first detectable finding of insulin resistance, okay? And they also would infuse by IV uh, lipid fat, and that would cause insulin resistance. Whereas they infuse carbohydrate, it does not. So this is further confirmation that insulin resistance is due to dietary fat, okay? And also Bart will say, oh, diabetes means high blood sugar. No, it doesn't. It means insulin resistance is a key point. High blood sugar is a symptom of diabetes, okay? And yes, you'll, you'll, you'll stage diabetes by how bad it is by looking at the hemoglobin A1C, by looking at the fasting blood sugar and whatnot. But the key point is what's causing this problem to happen. And what's causing the problem to happen is the elevated uh, dietary fat as the main cause. There's other things that contribute to that. Psychological stress can contribute to it, for example. Uh, elevated cortisol contribute to it. Caffeine will make it worse, for example. Okay, a low-fat vegan diet improves blood sugar control, glycemic control, and cardiovascular uh, risk factors in type 2 diabetes. So what is the paper saying? It's saying patients do better if you feed them a low-fat vegan diet, the diabetics, okay? Low-fat vegan is the best diet to feed uh, type 2 diabetics. And a smart type 2 diabetic wants to cure themselves because it's always curable if they get that started while well, they still have insulin production coming out of their pancreas. Um, once they lose the ability to make insulin, then they're kind of ending up like a type 1 diabetic who can't make insulin at all. So here's insulin sensitivity, what it's all about. Normally, insulin binds the insulin receptor in the plasma membrane, let's say in a skeletal muscle cell, and that sends a signal that these uh, vesicles here within the cytoplasm that contain GLUT4, those are glucose type 4 transporters, should travel up to the plasma membrane and merge with it. And then the glucose type 4 transporters become channels to allow glucose into the cell. And so that's how glucose gets in the cell. The insulin binds, 
and then the GLUT4s are sent up to the plasma membrane, and then glucose can get in. So this is an important point. The glucose can't get in unless these glucose type 4s merge with the uh, plasma membrane. It's an important point. Exercise will create the same effect, and that's why exercise is one of the best things a type 2 diabetic can do because it will increase insulin sensitivity. Get those GLUT4s up to the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscles so your postprandial uh, glucose can be stored as glycogen in the skeletal muscle. That's what you ideally want most of it to have uh, be done with it. So here is what is called insulin resistance. So let's say a person has eaten extra excess dietary fat on the previous meal and the current meal, and it causes what has been called overnutrition in the uh, mitochondria, the inner mitochondrial membrane electron transport chain. It actually starts to block it at around complex two, complex three, and it starts to back up. It starts leaking uh, electrons. That's a whole other story. But the important point is it sends a so-called overnutrition signal to prevent these glucose type 4 transporters from going up to the plasma membrane. And once these glucose type 4 transporters can't go to the plasma membrane, that means glucose can't get into the cell. So the blood glucose remains high. And because we're talking about after a meal here, postprandial, this is postprandial hyperglycemia is due to accumulation of fat in the muscle. By the way, accumulation of fat in the liver leads to hyperglycemia, high blood glucose when the person is fasting. So that's fasting hyperglycemia. So high blood glucose after a meal due to muscle, intramyocellular lipid, fat. High blood glucose around the clock during fasting as well, that's due to fatty liver. Okay, then another thing is I showed you how glucose can't get into the skeletal muscle unless um, there are those glucose type transporters getting into the into the plasma membrane, so you need insulin sensitivity. But with fatty acids, they tried to block fatty acids entering uh, the cytoplasm of the cell, and they can't do it. Because you, you can block these transporters. There are such a thing as fatty acid transporters in a plasma membrane. But even if you block them, the fat still keeps coming in. It's thought to do something called a flip-flop maneuver, whereby the fatty acid approaches the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane, becomes um, you know, protonated and neutral and intercalates itself into the membrane and then flips into the inner leaflet. Okay, here's the big paper on that by Anthony J. James Hamilton, 2020. This guy did research on that for many, many years, decades, um, and uh, that's what it shows. So the only smart way, how are you going to reduce this amount of fat getting into that skeletal muscle? Reduce your amount of dietary fat. That's the smart thing to do. Okay, in my experience, most diabetics manage their diabetes in a rather stupid way. They always say, oh, I got it under control, I got it under control, I'm taking my pills, and they're looking at their blood glucose level and stuff, but why take a pill the rest of your life when you could cure it by going low-fat vegan um, if you still got your pancreas insulin function, as most of them do initially? All the type 2s, officially type 2s, do initially. Okay, so anyways, here is um, a capillary, red blood cells traveling through a capillary. RBC, again, is about 7 microns. Capillary is about 5 microns. These spindle-shaped cells there forming the wall of the capillary are called endothelial cells. You got a little spindle-shaped nucleus as well. They're orientated along the long axis of the vessel. But the important point is these little blue circles are oxygen, and they get through, and they go, and they supply the tissue. Like, let's say we're in your brain. This is your neuron. Um, here's the capillary basement membrane, the yellow in here. The green are the uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, so now here's a capillary with hypertension, um, which is caused by high-fat, high-sodium uh, diets, or by diabetes caused by high-fat diets. Um, sodium, high dietary sodium also makes it worse diabetes. But here's my point. The capillary basement membrane gets thickened. See how thick this yellow membrane is compared to up, up here, the normal one? And it can be glycated, for example. Then you get hypertrophy of the vascular smooth muscles increased in number and potentially collagen laid down in there as well, thickened. So now when this is becoming progressively thickened, it's harder for the oxygen to pass from the red blood cell to the tissue, like the neuron in this case. So you're going to keep on having worsening oxygen delivery leading to, you know, ischemia means lack of oxygen, hypoxia, lack of oxygen. That's all bad because that's going to cause neurons to die. And that's going to make a person demented and stupid. In addition, they found that the glucose type 4 transporters were previously thought to not be present in the brain cells and neurons, but they are present in the brain cells and neurons. So the insulin sensitivity in the periphery from the high-fat diet also causes insulin resistance in the periphery of the body. That means outside the central nervous system, outside the brain and the spinal cord. It also is translated to the brain and the spinal cord. There are glucose type 4 transporters there. So <clears throat> the fact that you've got glucose type 4 transporters in your neuron means you need them to have insulin sensitivity in order to get all the glucose that neuron wants into it. So what am I trying to say here? That Insulin resistance in the context of diabetes 
also d diminishes the glucose delivered to the neurons. And when they can't meet their needs, you got you got metabolic rate, and you have to match that with oxygen glucose delivery to have neurovascular coupling, where the energy production matches the energy needs. So when you diminish the amount of glucose getting into that cell, you run the risk that the metabolic rate is too high relative to the um, the glucose delivery, and that can lead the cell to die by what is called apoptosis. And, and other lectures like the Peter Rogers MD theory of neurovascular uncoupling as a cause of dementia, I go into much more detail about that. But the bottom line is it's bad for your neurons. Diabetics are some of the stupidest people I know. I say the stupidest people I know would be typically your kidney failure patients, your dialysis patients. They're notoriously markedly slow mentally. And then the next uh, large group of patients that are very, very cognitively slow would be type 2 diabetics. So, you know, obstructive sleep apnea also is very well known for causing, you know, people falling asleep when you're talking to them and not able to, you know, maintain a conversation. But all those things are bad. And they all go to, they, they go together, you know, the obstructive sleep apnea patients are often diabetic, okay, and hypertensive. Okay, a low-fat vegan diet, in a randomized trial. So here's another randomized controlled trial um, with diabetes, and they did much better. Low-fat vegan diet appeared to improve glycemia and plasma lipids in comparison with, you know, like the American Diabetic Association diet, which is relatively high fat and high in animal protein in comparison. And the old joke of Nathan Pritikin used to say the American Diabetic Association diet was guaranteed to make patients stay diabetic, whereas low-fat vegan, you often cure them. Okay, hemoglobin A1c is a marker of you know, hemoglobin is in a red blood cell, which typically lasts 120 days. So it's about a three-month marker of their blood glucose control. And the patients that went vegan had much better blood glucose control, and they lowered their hemoglobin A1c, that measurement of overall uh, how well blood glucose levels are maintained. Oh, here's just another paper about improved glucose tolerance tests with high-carbohydrate feeding. And same thing like Hemsworth showed. You feed them carbohydrate, and their insulin sensitivity improves. Because some people say, oh, you shouldn't give sugar or starches to diabetics, and that's not true. The more carbohydrate they eat, the better they do, okay? And interesting, too, if you look at those Mastering Diabetes guy, you know, Cyrus, Kumbata, and uh, what's his name, Robbie Bittero, those guys eat tons of fruit, tons and tons of carbohydrate, and they're pretty good experts. I like those guys. I think they know what they're talking about. And so what I'm saying is, if you go to conventional medicine, they're always going to, they have a tendency to promote all these high-fat diets for diabetes, whereas the two guys living with it who are real smart, they both are, uh, you know, low-fat plant-based, okay? That's the smarter way to go. We'll also talk about, you know, Kempner in a moment here. High-carbohydrate, high-fiber diet um, results in type 2 diabetics. The high-carbohydrate and high-fiber diet had, and less sat fat had the best predicted weight loss. So when diabetics lose weight, they tend to lose the fat from their liver, and then they also tend to increase their insulin sensitivity. So it's dramatically beneficial for them. Okay, adherence to vegetarian diet for diabetes. Meta-analysis of a whole bunch of patients shows that a vegetarian diet is inversely associated with diabetes. Yeah, so the more vegetarian you are, the less your diabetes. And of course, that should be low-fat vegetarian. All right, diabetic diabetic. Dietary lipids <clears throat> and blood cholesterol, a metabolic ward study. It's always going to show you the same thing. Um, <clears throat> when the British diets replace their saturated fat with other fats um, and their uh, decrease their dietary cholesterol, they had a marked reduction in their total cholesterol and especially in their low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, the real atherogenic one. So what's the point of that? Saturated fat, meaning animal fat especially, was especially bad pushing towards... Um, high blood lipids, which pushes towards um, diabetes and uh, hypertension and atherosclerosis, okay? So that's what I'm trying to say is, you know, you can't make 100% um, animal food diet into a good diet. You can't polish a turd, okay? It's a loser. You can't make it good. And that's kind of the point I'm going through all these studies to show there's no wiggle room out of this. It's, it's a bogus, unhealthy way to eat. High protein diets affect on coronary blood flow. So HPG is high protein diets. They'll, they'll cause worsening of multiple variables. They lead to increased fibrinogen, bad, increased CRP, bad. They also end up leading to increased dietary cholesterol. So this suggests that high protein diets may precipitate progression of coronary artery disease and increase lipid um, and inflammation and coagulation pathways. Yeah, they're bad. And as T. Colin Campbell had pointed out that a long time ago, they're very atherogenic, not to mention they're carcinogenic meaning that they increase cancer risk, heart attack, and stroke risk. All bad. Okay, this comes from a lecture by Dr. McDougall where he's talking about Walter Kempner. I got some of my own lectures, too, on Walter Kempner. But Walter Kempner, you know, McDougall said he thinks he's the greatest doctor who ever lived. 
he put a whole bunch of patients on a rice diet from around 1940 to around 1980 got incredibly good results. He treated over 19,000 patients. He, I, I read his books. I read his research papers. They're extraordinary. He's got all these patients. He shows shrinkage of their congestive heart failure, heart, improvements in kidney function. He markedly reduced their protein intake. And animal foods all have high protein. Even skim milk is high protein, okay? So if you really want to lower, lower dietary protein, you have to avoid animal foods, all right? So anyways, by dramatically lowering the amount of protein in the diet, it protects the kidney. The main thing a kidney does, most of a kidney's energy is towards excreting nitrogen. There's no nitrogen in carbohydrate. There's no nitrogen in fat. The nitrogen comes from uh, protein, and we don't have a good way to store it. So it gets excreted by the kidneys, and it increases that workload of the kidneys. So when you avoid animal foods, you dramatically reduce the nitrogen in excretion workload. You also cause much less inflammation, and excretion of inflammation-related waste products also puts a big burden on the kidney. It pushes the kidney into something called hyperfiltration. All bad, okay? Um, in addition, he reduced dietary sodium, and that combination of reducing fat, reducing sodium, and you're going to be increasing uh, potassium when you eat plants, he, he had incredible reversal of a lot of patients' hypertension. He had patients whose uh, systolic hypertensions were in the 200s. Normally, it should be something like 110 over 70. And he, would get, he got a lot of patients from 200-something down to normal blood pressures, okay, or close to normal blood pressures. Extraordinarily good. And according to McDougal, he, he reversed, reversed type 2 diabetes in 100% of patients. That's not a misprint. That's not a misstatement. Uh, he re reversed type 2 diabetes in 100% of patients with this low-fat, low-sodium diet. That's an extraordinary statement. So that means that a cure is within reach. Some type 2s are really type 1.5s, but, you know, the point is that they have all should take a try at trying to cure themselves if they've got a brain in their head. Okay, here's another interesting thing, too. If you go into PubMed, which is where all the scientific papers are, and you try to read... Um, Kempner's papers, here's what you find. No abstract available. These are all Walter Kempner. Every single one of these articles is Walter Kempner. No abstract, no abstract, no abstract, no abstract, no abstract, no abstract, no abstract. There's nothing like this, okay? This is, my opinion, is suppression, suppression of the truth. They don't want anybody to know this. They don't want all these proles, all these peasants to know the truth that all they got to do is go low fat vegan and they can cure themselves. No, 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 no. This is all hidden. They don't want you to know that Walter Kempner existed. He's just a figment of your imagination. Nothing to see here. Move along. Okay? It's ridiculous. All right? Type 2 diabetes is curable. Okay? But they don't want you to know that because, you know, drug companies are making tons and tons of money. Billions of dollars on this stuff. Billions of dollars on diabetes pills and hypertension pills that all the low IQ pros, you know, are eating high fat diets, making themselves sick when they could be cured easily. Most of them. All right, so here's a nice biography. This is written by Barbara Newborg. She's a lady doctor who was his assistant to, to, to Kempner. So she, she went on rounds with him every day. She knows the guy pretty well. It's a good book. Okay, there's also, like I said, videos. I made videos about Kempner, and there's other videos about him uh, interviewing the people who work with him on the Chef AJ channel, on the Dr. McDougall channel, and whatnot. Uh, vegetarian diets and blood pressure. So yeah, vegetarian diets are associated with lower BP. They're protective against hypertension. So I mean, look at that. If they protect you from obesity, they protect you from high blood pressure, they protect you from diabetes, and they protect you from atherosclerosis. Those are the main reasons people die right there. So why wouldn't you want it? Okay. I don't make any money from this. I just, you know, want to know the truth. I wish I had known this when I was younger. I wish I, I could have kept my father alive you know, healthy for an extra 25 years if I had known this. And I had an inkling of it, but back when he got sick was a long time ago. Okay, other benefits of plant food. Basically, the plants have all the good stuff. They got the fiber, potassium, magnesium, nitrates, the mag, uh, um, all the stuff you want. Magnesium is good not just for vasodilation. It also protects the brain. It's, it sits in the center of the NMDA receptor, so it prevents excitotoxicity. Other benefits, a plant-based diet is low intrinsically in sodium, high in potassium, so you get the good stuff. You want a high ratio of potassium to sodium in a normal, healthy person because that prevents hypertension and other problems. Um, and the vegan diet, you avoid the bad stuff. You avoid the animal protein and all its toxicity, increasing cancer risk, increasing kidney failure risk, increasing atherosclerosis, having accumulated the pesticides by eating high up on the food chain. They'll often feed estrogenic chemicals to the, to the you know, CAFO uh, feedlot um, cattle animals, for example. Meat has other problems to it. It has increased TMIO, which is very atherogenic and very inflammatory. Um, it also increases the risk of causing autoimmune disease through leaky gut and something else called xenocyelitis. 
okay, here's the deal with the estrogens. Normally a person's extra estrogens in their body are excreted. Um, I'll just get myself out of the way for a moment here. They're, the estrogens are excreted in, first of all, they go to the liver and the liver conjugates them. It binds them to something called glucuronic acid, okay? Then this glucuronic acid and the estrogen, E for estrogen, secreted into the bile, which goes into the intestinal tract, and then normally we would poop it out of our body. We defecate it out of our body to lower our estrogen levels. However, when you've got the bad gut bacteria, which means from a meat and processed food diet, they have more of an enzyme called glucuronidase, and that will cleave the glucuronic acid conjugation of the estrogen, and the estrogen then gets reabsorbed in the blood. So people who eat a lot of meat and have a lack of dietary fiber, also who eat a lot of processed foods, they will have more bad gut bacteria that have more of this enzyme, and so they will end up with higher uh, blood estrogen levels just for this reason, which means they have increased risk of obesity because estrogen is a fat storage hormone. It's obesogenic. They'll have increased risk of breast cancer, which tends to be sensitive to estrogen, increased risk of prostate cancer. The male prostate is kind of like the female breast in terms of being estrogen sensitive for proliferation and cancer risk. So basically, when you eat a high meat diet, it's like opening up Pandora's box, all these problems, okay? And many of the modern men are estrogenic, chemical overloaded, tending to make them fat. The so-called beer belly is, to a large extent, it looks like a pregnant, pregnant female belly, okay? And the moobs, man boobs, are gynecomastia. And what I'm trying to say is, actually, the plant eaters tend to have higher testosterone, not the meat eaters, okay? The meat eaters tend to be fat, and fat tissue has more of the enzyme aromatase, which converts testosterone into estrogenic chemicals, okay? Um, another thing too, the bad gut bacteria, they cause other problems. A high-fat diet causes more bile to be secreted by the liver, so you get more bile salts in the colon. That increases your risk of secondary bile salts and, and colon cancer risk. Also, the bad bacteria, they have a tendency to make more of something called hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic to the uh, gut lining cells. The enterocytes can cause them to die, something called enterocyte apoptosis. This contributes more so even then to more of this leaky gut effect, which predisposes to gut inflammation, predisposes to autoimmune disease. You see what I'm saying is you get yourself into vicious cycles of tissue damage and harmful things when you're eating a meat-based diet as well as processed foods. So these are all bad because you'll hear sometimes the meat promoters You'll hear them say different things. You'll hear Lustig and Johnson say, oh, high fructose corn syrup, it's the devil, it's the worst thing. And then you'll hear other guys like Chris Knob say, oh, the main problem is these omega-6 cooking oil. I'm, what I'm saying is they're all bad. The meat, the omega-6, the high fructose corn syrup, they're all bad. They're all you know, dietary toxins is how I would describe them and view them. So normally the fiber, and here's your gut. So here's good gut, normal health, and here's bad gut over here problems. All right. So normal gut, the fiber feeds the... Good gut, good gut bacteria, they convert the fiber into short-chain fatty acids, especially butyrate. The gut lining cells called the enterocytes because it's the enteric tract, they make these TJs, tight junctions. And the tight junctions are a solid barrier to protect, to protect the gut from leaky gut. The tight junctions are what you want, all right? And then this makes everything as it should be. <clears throat> When you get leaky gut, a lack of dietary fiber, now you get bad gut bacteria. They chew up the mucus around the uh, gut lining cells, and they secrete toxins called LPS, for example, lipopolysaccharide. Because of the lack of tight junctions, the LPS can get d below the gut lining cells into the lamina propria, into this area here. And then they activate the immune system, cause inflammation locally. That can cause irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. They can also get into the blood and cause blood clots, leading to increased risk of heart attack, to stroke. Uh, also just damaging small little blood vessels in the brain, gradually increasing the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. In particular, they predispose to a bad type of clotting called amyloidogenic clotting. Douglas Kell and Etheresia Pretoria have done the most work on that. Very interesting stuff. They predispose to autoimmune disease because now big chunks of protein can get across. Typically only a three consecutive amino acids, a tripeptide, could get across. But now big chunks of protein, especially an animal protein with an amino acid sequence similar to our own, can get through this gut lining and then activate the immune system. And the immune system will form antibodies to it, but because its amino acid sequence is so similar to our own, it'll sometimes cross-react with our own body. So having a similar amino acid sequence in this animal protein that got through the gut lining and it wasn't supposed to, that's called molecular mimicry. And then the antibody reacting with our own body is called cross-reactivity. 
and because it attacks our own body, it's called an autoantibody. So you'll sometimes hear this expressed as molecular mimicry with autoantibody cross-reactivity. And that's sort of like a summary of what happens in autoimmune disease. So the bottom line is you don't want it. This list of words here in this arrow that shows a changing from a good gut to a bad gut, these are all things that cause leaky gut. And of course, animal foods are at the top there with oils, antibiotics, and a whole bunch of other things. Caffeine also increases the risk of this. High fructose corn syrup increases the risk of this, and a bunch of other things. So if somebody has autoimmune disease, what I would do if I was in that setting, I would avoid all these things as best I could, um, try to resolve that. Okay, and like I said, you'll, you'll get LPS from gram-negative bacteria, LTA from gram-positive bacteria. These are the two types of endotoxins, so lipopolysaccharide from gram-negative bacteria and lipotychoic acid from gram-positive bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive, that's just a, a description of a staining method to categorize bacteria, and it causes a special type of clotting. We won't even go into it, but it's bad. Okay, and there's also something called xenocyolitis, meaning that these sialic acids that are a common part of uh, the coating on the outer surface of cells. The animal um, sialic acid, like in beef and stuff, it's different enough than ours. It's similar enough as ours that it initially fools the gut and gets absorbed into our bodies, but it's different enough that the immune system will recognize it, and it just causes another example of autoimmune disease where the body starts attacking itself, the immune system, because you're not supposed to be eating this stuff, and it gets into your uh, blood and causes problems. Okay, the other thing that gets in the blood in increased amounts with a meat-based diet is this TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, TMAO. And so the way you avoid that is don't eat a meat-based diet, okay? TMAO not only predisposes to blood clots, heart attacks, um, it causes a lot of inflammation and other disease. Just one more problem. Here's all the things TMAO is associated with. Increased risk of being fat, increased risk of metabolic syndrome increased risk of diabetes, increased risk of coronary artery disease, heart attack, increased risk of neurologic disease, okay, and cognitive decline, etc. It's all bad. Okay. Okay, you tend to become iron overloaded. The body normally sequesters iron to prevent infections and reactivation of bacteria. I'm not going to go into this too much, but just want to show you most Americans from meat and things like red meat, but it's also from iron fortified processed foods will become iron overloaded. Men, as soon as they stop growing, so in their 20s, women, as soon as they're postmenopause, they no longer have that monthly therapeutic phlebotomy for menstruation. And the excess iron, you can think of iron as being like a fire. It belongs in the fireplace, in the stove, there it's useful, but anywhere else it just causes damage. And that's what having excess uh, bodily iron does when it gets free from the binding proteins. And it can cause what is called ferrous redox cycling between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, releasing electrons. And it can even be autocatalytic to generate free radicals, reactive oxygen species, due to something called the Fenton reaction, Fe for Fenton, Fe for ferrous. And what this means is you've got more oxidants than antioxidants because you don't eat enough plants. And you've been eating too much red meat and processed food fortified with iron. And you'll start becoming iron overloaded as you become older. And you're going to start running these harmful reactions spontaneously and they just damage your tissues. So you avoid them by avoiding iron fortified foods and avoiding things like red meat. Okay, um, the hypertension predisposes you to this condition here. It's a cause of dementia. This is really the vascular hypothesis of dementia as put forth by Jack Delatore. I'm not, we don't have time to go into it all, but I'm just letting you know meat diets increase the risk of dementia related to the atherogenic vascular hypothesis, okay? Um, this is where people mostly get strokes, okay? One of the things I do, I'm triple boarded, I'm also a neuroradiologist, and they cause a lot of strokes in this area. I'll see hundreds of strokes every day in this area. Because the, the same one person can have, you know, 100 or more. Most people have them, you know, in the ballpark. Let's say after 55, most Americans have a few little silent strokes. But as they get older, they'll tend to accumulate more. Don't get me wrong. Some people are 85 and have none of them, okay? So somebody who's ate a healthy, low-fat, vegan diet or close to it, they might have zero. They might have a perfect-looking brain in their 90s. That's what you want to aim for, okay? But I'm letting you know, eating the meat worsens it. So here would be a perfectly normal brain. Normal-sized cerebral ventricles. These contain the cerebral spinal fluid. They're small. There's no hot spots, so to speak, no bright white spots here. Here's a, a, a brain with tons of little strokes. We call them silent strokes in the sense that the patient's not hemiplegic, but they're typically cognitively slow, and they're slow in their, in their motor movements as well. So all these little white spots are uh, little strokes. And this would be like a typical-looking 85-year-old, all right? But I often see brains like this with patients in their 60s and 70s. And I even sometimes see brains looking like this in the 40s and 50s, patients with a lot of hypertension, for example, and a lot of diabetes. 
Okay, we're not going to go into all the detail, but basically the same thing causing atherosclerosis, knocking off uh, brain cells, also damages the spine. Ischemic spine disease, I wrote an entire book on this subject, um, <clears throat> causing degenerative spine disease, degenerative disc disease, diffuse idiopathic skeletal, hy skeletal hyperostosis with these uh, osteophytes. The lumbar arteries coming off the abdominal aorta get stenosed and occluded, and that makes the spine ischemic and damages it. Okay, so what I basically said here is, hopefully after hearing all this, you've seen the light and you're ready to convert to becoming a low-fat vegan if you have a brain in your head. Um, and then you can minimize your risk of all those uh, terrible diseases that make people fat, sick, and stupid, and they're very sad, and there's no other good way to fix them. There's no pill, you know, even in the ballpark, even in the ballpark next to the ballpark next to the ballpark compared to going low-fat vegan. And the other things help, too. Get your sleep, manage your stress, avoid caffeine, avoid oils, all this stuff. But anyways, you know, the, the proper attitude when you understand this is, Oh, I don't inevitably have to become fat, sick, and stupid like most old people. I can avoid it. Here's what I got to do. Great. I'm 60 years old, by the way. 60 years old. My brain's fine. Everything else is, works. Everything is good. Okay, I'm going to try to keep this way. So the proper attitude is, thank you, God. There's something I can do. I'm not automatically screwed. And here's what I call the Spartan vegan diet. You know, this is, comes from me. It's basically, you know, very much, it's very similar to the Esselstyn diet, the Pritigan diet, the McDougal diet. Okay, low-fat, low-sodium, plant-based diet. You know, maintain your social relationships, get your exercise, get your sunshine, your sleep. Religion makes people healthier too. Eat primarily starch for the vast majority of your calories, anywhere from 60 to 90% of your calories. You can have some fruits as well, enjoy them, especially if you exercise a lot, you can handle more fruit. If you don't exercise at all, I gotta be careful because you might overeat them. Uh, get some vegetables, you get your nitrates and some other nutrients from there. The only supplement I take is a vitamin B12, methylcobalamin. I never would take cyano, I don't want that cyano stuff accumulating in my body. Okay, um, and then here's a joke, I call this the diet nirvana pyramid. And so basically, you know, people kind of often they eat a terrible diet when they're young because they don't know any better. And their parents didn't know any better. So I call this the paleo, keto, low carb, health, hell for morons. Okay. And, you know, you, the, the guy we were talking about earlier was recommending people eat this way. I don't think that's a smart idea. And then gradually you can work your way up towards uh, diet nirvana, low fat, low sodium, vegan. It's real simple and it's cheap. Starch is cheap and it stores well. I mean, what more would you want? The thing that optimizes your health is also cheap. So anyways, that's it. Um, I hope that was helpful. And so, yes, I do think paleo, keto, carnivore, low-carb diets are a joke. People can get short-term benefits from them by putting a lot of effort into them, but they're not sustainable typically long-term, and the patients end up much worse off because they've got insulin resistance leading to increased risk of all these uh, medical problems, increased risk of of uh, let's say cancer, for example, and development of diabetes, for example. So anyways, I hope you found this helpful, and um, I hope Bart will see the light and uh, start eating more plants and encouraging his viewers to eat more plants. And so anyways, I hope that was helpful.